Good morning. It is Friday, and it is the 1st of September, and it's about 8.15 in the morning. And I'm making videos to go over the first contact, or the after first contact slides in lecture, so that you have a little bit better understanding of what it's about. So this is the follow-up to the first lecture of before first contact. Now, the first European explorers who are going to start this whole thing, uh, they were actually trying to find a way to get to India and to get to China. Um, world history related, there were some wars that happened in the Middle East called the Crusades, and Islam and Christianity weren't getting along very well, so all the trade routes over land were shut down. But there were things that Europeans still wanted that they were going to try and get from places like India and China. The Portuguese are going to be the first ones to really start to do this exploring. They're the ones who take the lead. They're the ones who are going to want to find the, the way to get to India. And as early as, I think, the 1300s or maybe early 1400s, the Portuguese have made it all the way to the Azores, which is like a third of the way across the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, but they had to stop exploring because of this little thing called the Black Death that killed like 50% of all the Europeans. So the first European explorations are going to go to Africa. And when they get there, they realize that there is a gold trade and that there's a slave trade and that they can make money out of this. The Portuguese are going to make contact with some African leaders. Uh, Portuguese are going to at offer European goods and weapons in exchange for being allowed into the gold trade and the slave trade. The Portuguese are going to change the slavery f system uh, under African, uh, how do I want to say it? The African system of slavery, I guess would be the best way to put it was a lot different and in the African system of slavery you were usually a slave because you committed a crime or you owed a debt or you've done something wrong or maybe you were just given to somebody as a as a present almost. In African slavery your condition of slavery was not permanent you had some protections legally and you could be given your freedom and that happened very often there are at evidences and cases where former slaves turn into tribal leaders. Uh, in Europe though, um, slavery is going to be based on race and it's going to be in perpetual or in perpetuity. I can't talk today. It's Friday. Uh, it's going to be forever. And in African slavery, if you have a kid, your kid is free. But in European slavery, if you have a kid, your kid is going to be a slave, and it is going to be a lot more permanent, a lot more strict, and a lot bigger in the European form of slavery. Now, there are some African leaders who are going to use this European slavery system to increase their wealth and increase their power. There's going to be a lot of warfare in Africa, and there are going to be societal breakdowns that happen because of this European slavery. Better known than the Portuguese are the Spanish explorers. Um, you've got Christopher Columbus, you've got Hernan Cortez, you've got Francisco Pizarro, you've got uh, Ponce de Leon, and you've got some others as well who are going to come to America from Spain. One really important thing I want to get out there, Columbus did not discover America. Columbus was actually one of the last explorers to get here. Uh, before Columbus got here, there were several uh, Portuguese. There was an Irishman. There was uh, some Chinese explorers. There were even some Viking explorers. Columbus, when you look at the timeline, is one of the last to come and sail to America as an explorer. Columbus had a map called Ptolemy's map. I'm not going to give you any questions on a test about Ptolemy's map. This is just for information. Uh, Ptolemy's map said that the world was round and that you could sail from Europe west to China. And Columbus had a copy of this map. And when he left Spain in August of 1492, 
he sailed west because according to the map he had, he should get to China. Well, in October of 1492, Columbus's crew finds land, they discover some islands, and according to Ptolemy's map, he sailed far enough west, he should have been off the coast of China. So, Columbus, basically, he got lucky, he accidentally found some islands, and he went to his grave not knowing that he was off the coast of North America. So what does Columbus actually do? He does map out most of the major islands. He maps out some of the Bahamas, Cuba, Hispaniola, uh, Jamaica, Puerto Rico. And he makes, I think it's five voyages to the New World, one of which saw him sent back to Spain in handcuffs because he was such a terrible guy. And he exploited the people in the Caribbean. He used them for his benefit. He stole a lot of money from them. And he worked thousands, if not millions, of them to death. Uh, the conquistadors, Pizarro, Cortez, Ponce de Leon, they wanted fame and fortune for themselves. For example, Cortez was a minor Spanish official who was based in Cuba. He wasn't happy and he came to what is today Mexico against the law and against the orders of the Cuban governor. And he is going to find the Aztec Empire and defeat the Aztec Empire in about a year. How could Cortez do this? Well, the Aztecs were not very friendly. They weren't very well liked. Something about human sacrifice and all their, their neighbors being enemies. And Cortez just talked to the right people and was able to uh, use the enemies of the Aztecs against him. Uh, Francisco Pizarro. He hears legends of a s huge silver mine in South America. And so he gathers a couple hundred men and he lands in what is today Colombia and marches south towards where he's heard that the silver is. What he finds is the Inca Empire in the middle of a civil war. Uh, the Sapa Inca, the leader, has just recently died. The two sons are fighting over who the next Sapa Inca will be. And Pizarro helps brother number one defeat brother number two. And then Pizarro double crosses brother number one. It takes less than four years for Pizarro to defeat the Inca Empire. And the Inca Empire at the time was the largest empire that the Americas had ever seen. Now, there's a little bit of irony in this. All the gold and all the silver that the Spanish conquistadors and the Spanish explorers send back to Spain absolutely wrecks their economy. It causes inflation to go through the roof to the point that the gold and silver was worthless. Uh, it causes starvation because the worthless money doesn't buy anything. And then the Spanish didn't even get to keep the gold and silver that they brought over because it was still owed to bankers and they had kicked out the bankers a couple years before because of religious reasons. One thing Spain does do is they set up permanent colonies, they set up permanent settlements, and they set up per uh, permanent missionaries. These colonies were kept under tight control by the Spanish crown. There were always Spanish politicians and Spanish government officials directly ruling their colonies. And the missionaries, they were members of the Catholic Church. They were part of an order called the Jesuits. And whenever I teach the Jesuits in my world history class, I just refer to them as the Pope's stormtroopers. Because whenever people need to be converted or, or forcibly converted or forcibly, you know, their customs changed, the Jesuits are the ones that go in because they were a military religious order. And so the Spanish Jesuit missionaries, they're going to do their best to destroy native ways of life, native religions, and native customs. There are some northern traders. The French are going to get involved in North America primarily just for fur. The Dutch and the Swedes are going to get involved for fur and for fishing. And there are a couple of large settlements, but not many. Um, I've got them listed here. Quebec, Montreal, St. Louis, New Orleans. Those are the biggest French settlements. 
Uh, the Swedes have smaller settlements. The Dutch, they have New Amsterdam, which we know better today as New York. Some of the native groups get so dependent on contact with the, the Europeans that they give up a lot of their way of life and start relying completely and totally on the French. The Jesuits will be involved with the French, the Dutch, and the Swedes, but they approach things a little differently than they did under the Spanish. Um, French Jesuits would live with the locals, learn their customs, and then start teaching them English or, or French or Dutch or whatever language it's, it is that was needed. And then the Jesuits from France and, and those places would kind of say, well, here's your, your god or gods, and here's, here's our god, and here's how they're the same. The Jesuits, whether on purpose or accident, though, they do bring European diseases to the New World. And because the New World population has little to no immunity to these European diseases, it's going to wreak havoc. And that brings me actually to the Colombian Exchange. The Colombian Exchange, it is the transfer, whether it's by, uh, intentional or unintentional, it's the transfer of biological materials between the old world and the new world. And this can be broken down into some, to some categories. Foods, drinks, diseases, and people. Some of the foods that are going to be transferred are potatoes. Potatoes were a product of the Andes, the mountains of South America. They're brought to, the, to Europe, and it's discovered they grow very well in places like Ireland, England, and northern Germany. Corn is the most important food that's going to come over. Uh, corn is related to grass. It was grown in Central America, and it becomes the food that's going to feed Europe, and that's because it's so efficient. On average, your ear of corn has 70-something kernels, and if you plant a kernel of corn, you get 70-something more, if, depending on how many ears the, the corn plant grows. And it can just feed so many people compared to something like wheat or barley. It was also easier to harvest. Today, corn is used for sweeteners. It's used for fuel. It's used for plastics. It's used for food. You name it. And then finally, we have tomatoes. Uh, tomatoes were originally from Central America. And they were brought to Europe where Italians, for whatever reason, fall in love with them. And Italians are going to adopt the tomato and come up with the cuisine that we love today. If you're curious, the word in Italian for tomato is pomodoro, which means golden apple. Why did they call it a golden apple? Quite frankly, they had nothing to compare it to other than an apple when it came to Europe. Related to both foods and drinks is sugar. Uh, Sugarcane is discovered and it grows very well in Central America, South America, and parts of North America. And sugar is discovered at the same time that the natural honeybee supply and the natural honey supply starts to drop in Europe. And the Europeans still have a, a relatively high sweet tooth. So it's discovered that sugar grows very well. Sh large sugar plantations are set up. And to work these large sugar plantations, large numbers of slaves are going to be employed. Originally, native slaves were going to be used, but that doesn't work. They either die out because they're not able to do the work, or they escape and they blend in with the other locals. So Europeans start bringing African slaves over to the New World because, number one, they're more used to the hard work and the climate. Number two they stick out compared to the, the native populations and they're easier to track down and find if they run away. So these plantations grow larger and larger, the number of slaves needed grows larger and larger, and before you know it, the slave trade is absolutely gigantic coming to the new world. Drinks. We got tea, we got coffee, we got chocolate. <clears throat> While tea was a product originally of China and India. 
it was exported to the New World where it was discovered that it grew very, very well. And before you know it, you've got tea plantations in places like Brazil, Costa Rica, Northern South America, and Southern Central America. Same thing with coffee. Coffee was originally grown in Arab lands like Saudi Arabia, places like that, because a devout Muslim cannot drink alcohol. Coffee still has transformative effects on the body, and so that was an approved drink for Islamic forces. Well, coffee became popular in Europe. A coffee plant was taken to South America where it flourished, and before you know it, a coffee trade is going to be developed in Central and South America, where a lot of it is still based today. And the last but not least, chocolate was originally a drink. It was a medicinal drink of Central America. Europeans fall in love with the idea of chocolate, and today chocolate's everywhere as well. The human aspect has to do with slaves. Uh, something like 10 to 12 million people are taken into bondage and slavery and sent to the Americas, while lesser known, another 12 to 15 million people are taken to Asia. And the populations of Africa are going to be just wiped out and devastated from this. Entire societies collapse, there's famine, there's warfare, there's gender imbalance, you name it. And um, slaves are going to make a, a large impact on the way of life for most of North and South America. And last but not least, we have disease. Um, this is a list of diseases that were not seen in the Americas that were brought by Europeans. Smallpox, the flu, measles, mumps, rubella, you name it. Um, because there was no immunity to those diseases in the New World, in North or South America, the estimates are something like 90%, that's 9 out of every 10 people, succumbed and died to these Old World diseases. There was one disease brought from the Old World, or from the New World back to the Old World, and that was syphilis. And, um, you know, syphilis, a sexually transmitted disease, so you can see what that means uh, as far as the New World population and the Old World population. Uh, somebody who was from Europe slept with a local, got sick, and brought that disease back to Europe. <coughs> All right, so less than 20 minutes. Um, if you have any concerns or questions or suggestions on how to make these videos more exciting or watchable, please just let me know. And um, I'll send you out an email letting you know what work is due this week. And I hope you guys have a good weekend and a good Labor Day. We'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.